Let's pray together. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, those gathered here, they are my delight. Those who choose another God multiply their sorrows, their libations of blood I will not pour out or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places, including this place tonight. Yes, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In this night also the Lord instructs me. Keep the Lord always before me. Because he's at my right hand, I will not be moved. You show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Would you bestow those pleasures on this people through the life and ministry of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, I pray. Would you strengthen this seminary? Would you make this Nicole Institute of Baptist Studies a stunning success in raising up reformed Baptist lovers of Christ and of his church and of the world? So do these things and exceedingly more than I can think to ask, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you, Don, for your kind introduction and for the invitation to be here and thank all of you for coming. It is a huge pleasure to talk about Spurgeon. That third point at least is true, that I uh, have no problems delighting in the preparations of a message on Spurgeon. Spurgeon was the kind of Calvinist who would have celebrated the founding of the Nicole Institute of Baptist Studies at a non-Baptist Reformed Theological Seminary. And the reason I know he was is because he himself founded a college and appointed George Rogers as the first principal of his pastor's college who was a Congregationalist pedo-Baptist. So I know he would have been happy about me being here and would have approved of my approval of this institute at a school like this. Spurgeon was a Baptist, but like some of us, and maybe like Roger Nicole, I I don't know, I never talked to him about this, though we met a few times, he spoke at our conference once upon a time. Like some of us, We have not all found our deepest soul brothers in our own denomination. He put it like this, Spurgeon. If I disagree with a man on 99 points, but happen to be one with him in baptism, this can never furnish such a ground of unity as I have with another with whom I believe in 99 points and only happen to differ upon one ordinance. I have found that to be true. That many of my deepest soul brothers have not been a part of my own denomination. And therefore, relationally, spiritually, I find this kind of relationship life-giving and approve of it. I am glad I am not restricted to Baptist circles for finding brothers and sisters whose instincts are so like my own that we can pick up the conversation almost anywhere. In fact, in the late 1880s, during the downgrade controversy, over liberalism in the Baptist Union in England, it was the evangelical Anglicans who befriended and supported the beleaguered Spurgeon who was being vilified 
by his more liberal Baptist brothers. There was in Spurgeon's life, and I would like there to be in mine, uh, a kind of robust, joyful, serious, Christ-exalting, atonement-cherishing, God-centeredness that made him feel a kinship with anyone with those same instincts. Here's how he described his Calvinism. To me, Calvinism means that the placing of the eternal God at the head of all things. I look at everything through its relationship to God's glory. I see God first and man far down the list. Brethren, if we live in sympathy with God, we delight to hear him say, I am God and there is none else. So you either like people like that or you don't. I do. If I hear somebody talk like that, I'm just moving their direction. And, and there are others who move the opposite direction. They don't want anybody to talk like that. That's not, that's not their language. That's not their instincts. That's not their feeling. It's just not where they are. And, and that's sad when the people that you, you feel like you should be close to seem to react like that to a statement like Spurgeon's. He was through and through a Calvinist, but not out of allegiance to a system, not out of allegiance to Calvin, not out of allegiance to a institutes, not out of allegiance to a tradition, not out of allegiance to a denomination, but because he thought Calvinism, as he understood it, was a poor name for full-blooded biblical gospel. Here's what he said. Puritanism, Protestantism, Calvinism are poor names which the world has given to a great and glorious faith, the doctrine of Paul, the apostle, the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And many great Reformed theologians have talked that way, not embracing some marginal, eccentric system, but rather drawing out the fundamental implications of the gospel to their fullness and their depth makes one a Calvinist. He believed and I believe. That's why he was open and unashamed to preach the whole counsel of God, even if he was called a, a Calvinist or it was called Calvinism. It was, he said, the gospel. He said, people come to hear me for one thing. I preach to them a Calvinist creed and a Puritan morality. That's what they want. That's what they'll get. If they want something else, they go elsewhere. And a lot of them came. He was so riveted, and if you've read any of his sermons, you know he was a bee buzzing around one light. He was so riveted on the substitutionary atonement through the cross and the supremacy of Christ that he could smell the aroma of the new birth in many places outside Calvinist circles. Far be it from me, he said, to imagine that Zion contains none but Calvinistic Christians within her walls, or that there are none saved who do not hold our views. I rejoice to confess that I feel sure there are some of God's people even in the Romish church. <clears throat> On the first Sunday of the newly built Metropolitan Tabernacle holding 5,600 people, on the first Sunday of his moving in to that, it was 1861, he was 27 years old, 
old. He had been at that church since he was 19. It was called New Park Street Church. On the first Sunday in the new building with a new name for the church, he said this. I would propose <coughs> that the subject of the ministry in this house, as long as this platform shall stand, and as long as this house shall be frequented by worshipers, shall be the person of Jesus Christ. I am never ashamed to avow myself a Calvinist. I do not hesitate to take the name Baptist. But if any man asks me my creed, I reply, it is Jesus Christ. So I think he would be pleased with what's going on here and the founding of the Nicole Institute of Baptist Studies in a seminary with those instincts. And my prayer is that it would even serve symbiotically that the influence of God-centeredness and Godward piety would go both directions and thus the school and the institute be preserved till Jesus comes. That would be a great work of grace. Let me give you one biblical warrant for talking about Spurgeon because he would be uncomfortable with this. He, he just said... Jesus Christ is my creed, so why are you talking about me, Piper? You should be talking about Jesus. Well, relax, Charles. Um, <laughs> be, because the Bible that you believe in gives me warrant for what I'm doing here. And you might think I would go to Hebrews 11, which is where I go by default to justify loving Christian biography and reading about saints and writing about them, that's a great place to go, but I'm not going to go there. I'm going to go to Philippians 3.17. I'll read you this verse. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Now, that's an interesting verse. It doesn't say, keep your eyes on Christ, which, of course, is right. You should. It doesn't even say, keep your eyes on Paul, who keeps his eyes on Christ. It says, keep your eyes on, quote, those who walk according to the example you have in us in Paul. So follow it. There's Christ who should be watched, trusted, loved, hoped in, treasured, and imitated. And then there's Paul who imitates Christ. First Corinthians 11, 1. And then there's those who imitate Paul watching him. And then there's the Philippians who are to watch them. Christ, Paul, them, Philippians. So we've got three generations, Paul telling that one out there, not just to watch Christ, not just to watch him, but to watch those who watch him. I have zero reason to think that's a bad idea after the third generation. You with me? That, I think, should just be extrapolated out so that wherever you see a life lived in the power of Christ, according to the word of Christ, for the glory of Christ, watch it. Watch it. Don't ignore it. The Bible says watch it. So, Mr. Spurgeon, if you're upset about me watching you here and helping others watch you, I'm going to tell you to read your Bible. <laughs> So that's all I want to do with you here. I want to watch him for a few minutes with you. And, and whatever Paul expected to happen in Philippians 3.17 by watching those who are watching Paul, who's watching Jesus, I want that to happen to you. 
whatever Paul was after there. Spurgeon is one of those lives worth watching. Born, he was born June 19, 1834 in Kelvedon, Essex, England, the first of 17 children. Oh, one of you women should give a great lecture on his mother. <laughs> Seriously, she was an astonishing woman and is worthy uh, of another talk. So leave that to you. Maybe. If you don't do it, I might. <laughs> Converted at age 16, ironically, being driven by a snowstorm into a Methodist chapel and listening to a lay Methodist preacher. Isn't God great? <laughs> I love it. Don't you get your back up, Mr. Calvinist, you know. I'll convert people with Methodists. <laughs> yes, he will. Like John Wesley, there's a few thousand people converted and blessed. So got his start at age 16 in Christ in a most wonderful way. And a year later, he's a pastor. <laughs> this is crazy. At Water Beach Church, just outside Cambridge, went to it with Noel back in 2006. Got a picture taken in front of the stone that he laid by coming back later. He, only, he was only pastor there a year. And then he moves uh, when he's 19 uh, to... London as the pastor of uh, New, New Park Street Church, and he's there the rest of his life. Preaches, what, 38 years or so there. Um, you'll notice in that little summary, zero formal theological education. <laughs> so, sorry, RTS, you're not needed. <laughs> Uh, Spur Spur Spurgeon is one of a million. He, nobody should imitate Spurgeon because he's, you'll, you'll hear why in a minute. <laughs> no formal theological education and probably the most well-read pastor in England. In 1906, um, William Jewell College in Liberty, Missouri, bought his library of 5,103 volumes for $2,500. Some really stupid person in Britain let it go. <laughs> I, I mean, in 2006, Midwestern Baptist Seminary bought it from William Jewell College for $400,000. And it was sad. That's a sad story that a college would no longer be interested in having the library of Charles Spurgeon. So if you want to go see it, that's where it is in Kansas City, Missouri, and they, they do have it on display. I, I say that just to remind you that here's a man with no formal theological education, who in this room would put every one of us into the shade with regard to theological awareness, both historically and for his day probably contemporaneously. Married uh, Susanna in 1856, two years after he became the pastor there in London, had two sons, Charles and Thomas. Thomas became the pastor of the Metropolitan Tabernacle. After him, an impossible job, right, to fill Charles Spurgeon's shoes. Um, his wife became an invalid, and in the last decades of their life together, she scarcely ever heard him preach, though there was hardly a more devoted wife in serving his efforts in so many ways. Another story that should be told of another great woman in his life. He died after 38 years of preaching at the age of 57 in 1892, four years before my grandmother was born. And I just say that to give you some sense of generational proximity. Mamon, my grandmother, born four years after. 
after Charles Spurgeon died. He's considered by many, as you know, to be one of the greatest preachers since the days of the apostles, preached over 600 times before he was 20 years old. I became a pastor when I was 34 and had preached 15 times. <laughs> totally green and unprepared. And the church was very kind to me. In those pre-radio, pre-television, pre-internet days, his sermons sold 20,000 copies a week and were simultaneously translated or quickly translated into 20 foreign languages. Um, 63 volumes now, you can buy them, contain his lifetime of preaching, which is equal to the ninth 27 volume, ninth edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, and is the largest set of books by a single author in the history of the world. <laughs> and he died at 57. That's 10 years ago for me. <laughs> I'm 67. What am I doing? <laughs> there was no microphone, electricity, and he spoke to be heard by 5,600 people week in and week out. I remember one time we had a picnic with 200 people and a generator running in the background to make a microphone for me and the generator died. And I had to do Whitfield or Spurgeon. It was hard. 200 people. It was hard to be heard by 200 people. So he, that's why he died at 57. <laughs> Probably, one of, one of the reasons anyway. He preached at the Surrey Gardens to 20,000 people and slept for 24 hours straight. He was so exhausted. That, that's, that's the kind of musculature that's going in to throw your voice out to 20,000 people. It's, 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 it's two or three days work in an hour to do that. I couldn't do it. I couldn't scream my lungs out for a minute and be heard by 20,000 people. So you just get, a, get an impression what these men who labored before this microphone went through to be heard. Charles, his son, you might think is a biased witness to his dad's excellence, but also remember that there are many preacher's kids who are as critical of their dads as they are biased toward them. And therefore, I do not discount this son's testimony. There was no one who could preach like my father. In inexhaustible variety, witty wisdom, vigorous proclamation, loving entreaty, lucid teaching, with a multitude of other qualities, he must, at least in my opinion, ever be regarded as the prince of preachers. That's not a bad title for Charles Spurgeon. He was extraordinary. None of us will ever come close to being like Charles Spurgeon. We should not be paralyzed by that. I, I use one of his texts in my preaching class and I tell, I tell these guys, please, please do not measure yourself by Charles Spurgeon. It'll put you out of the ministry so fast. <laughs> so we, we, must, we just kind of stand back and admire, you know, like you, you admire a star or something, I mean in the sky, and um, don't try to be a, a nova, supernova. His abilities, his gifts were so remarkable and his accomplishments so many that um, we can scarcely list them. 
So what I want to do in the remaining time is to talk about two of his qualities. <laughs> this is very frustrating, right? To take somebody with a life like this and put it into 45 minutes and do two of 70 or 80 qualities that could be talked about. And my prayer now as I give you these two qualities and unpack them from his own experience is that they will be instilled in the pastors trained at the RTS and Nicole Institute of Baptist Studies. So that's my, my prayers I'm thinking. Now these two things I'm going to talk about for the remaining time, I, I want that to happen for young pastors or older pastors. Number one, Spurgeon loved God-centered, Christ-exalting, Bible-saturated truth and exulted over it in the pulpit. He loved truth, and in the pulpit, you could tell. He defined the work of a preacher like this. To know truth as it should be known, to love it as it should be loved, and then to proclaim it in the right spirit and in proper proportions. Close quote. That's a great statement about what preaching is. He said to his students, to be an effective preacher, you must be sound theologians. And he warned, those who do away with Christian doctrine are, whether they are aware of it or not, the worst enemies of Christian living. And that's why many people put Christian doctrine aside. Because they want to emphasize life, living, practicality. In Spurgeon's opinion, that's behavioral suicide. The doctrine feeds life. And over time, when doctrine goes away, life goes away, holiness goes away, mission goes away. Two years before he died, he gave an illustration of how crucial truth is in the ministry, and he reveals some of his humor um, that marked his ministry in a very serious way. Hear the tension, I intend it. He was a very funny man. And when he was accused of being too funny one time, he said, ma'am, if you knew how much I held back. And I know exactly what he's talking about. You know, you're preaching along and something really funny comes into your head. But you know, it doesn't belong here. <laughs> and a lot of pastors don't know how to control themselves. And so they, they think if they can get the people laughing, like you're laughing, that they're, they're doing good. They're, they're having successful co communication. Well, maybe. You might, may not be communicating anything. So here's what he says to illustrate the importance of truth. Some excellent brethren seem to think more of the life than the truth. Life over truth. For when I warn them that the enemy has poisoned the children's bread, they answer, dear brother, we are sorry to hear it. And to counteract the evil, we will open the window and give the children fresh air. Yes. Open the window and give them fresh air by all means. But at the same time, this ought you to have done and not left the other undone. Arrest the poisoners and open the windows too. While men go on preaching false doctrine, you may talk as much as you will about deepening their spiritual life, but you will fail in it. So one of the things I love about RTS is that I hear them getting this life doctrine interplay and how crucial they both are. I, I will testify, I just finished my ministry at Bethlehem on Easter. So 33 years, <clears throat> pastor in the same church, preached my last sermon on Easter Sunday evening. And I can testify now after, say, the, just, just take the last two months of this transition process, my successor is now 
in place. I went online to listen to him preach last Saturday night. I'm loving what God is doing at Bethlehem. My experience in the last just two months is to testify that the most common expression of gratitude coming my way from my people who have come up to me. We have this big service coming this Sunday night to say bye-bye, John. Um, but up until now, the most common expression of thankfulness has been from people who say that the storms of suffering in their lives have not overturned the boat of their faith because of the ballast of God-centered truth in their boat owing to God-centered preaching. So you hear, here's why I'm deeply gratified by those testimonies. Because what they're saying is, you're a God-besotted preacher. You elevate God's majesty a lot. It's weighty, it's heavy, and it has landed in our boats like ballast. And we have been hit by so many things in life. The death of a child, the death of a spouse, the loss of a job, the presence of breast cancer, and on and on and on. We've been hit, and our boat has not been turned over because there's, there's a weight of God in it. Thank you. Thank you. So do you hear the connection between God-saturated preaching and practicality of survival in life? This is very, very true. Spurgeon says it. I'm testifying to it. I'm sure most of you have discovered it. To know the truth as it should be known, this is his definition again of preaching, to know the truth as it should be known, to love it as it should be loved, to proclaim it in the right spirit and in its proper proportions. Let me give you a Bible verse to support what he's saying. 2 Thessalonians 2.10. Paul speaks of those who, quote, are perishing because they refused to love the truth and so to be saved. People are perishing, not just because they don't know the truth, they don't love it. Now, if you believe as a pastor that your people can perish everlastingly for not loving the truth, what would you do? Well, one of the things you would do is Tell them the truth and love it in front of them so that they absorb what it is to love the truth. It doesn't do anybody any good to say, here's the truth, love that, love that. What? Doesn't, emotions don't work that way. Can't tell your kid, like to clean your room, like it. But if you come alongside them and whistle in the first 10 or 20 times and turn it into a game and help the kid grow into his affections for good things, he might wind up finding a way to like cleaning his room. And I know that people find a way to love God by watching a pastor love God. So it's not a small thing when he defines preaching as to know the truth as it should be known and love it as it should be known, as it should be loved, and then, and then proclaim it in these proportions that are, that are biblical. Now, it doesn't go without saying, so I'll say it, that the source of all this truth for Spurgeon was the God-breathed, inerrant Christian Bible. He held up his Bible and said this, these words are God's. Thou book of vast authority, thou art a proclamation from the emperor of heaven. Far be it from me to exercise my reason in contradicting thee. This is the book untainted by any error, but it is pure, unalloyed, perfect truth. Why? Because God wrote it. 
uh, Spurgeon's talk about the Bible. Oh, those of you preparing for ministry, labor to free yourself from all doubt in God's inerrant word. If you labor a lifelong with this niggling doubt that, I don't know if I can preach on that text. I don't know if there might be some mythological leftovers here that uh, you're going to be lamed and you're going to be weak. You're going to come to the end of your days feeling like you've poured 75% of yourself out because you've just been constantly holding back. The Bible is worthy of your trust and a people want their pastor to labor, to know it, deliver it with confidence. He wasn't just a Bible-based preacher, though. He was a Bible-saturated preacher. I used that phrase earlier. And that's my passion for young pastors. If I did a seminar here, I would hammer on the head of every young aspiring preacher not to preach merely Bible-based sermons. Okay. Why not? I don't think it maximizes your impact, your authority, your effectiveness to hover just above the text, never sinking down so that people can see where this is coming from. I'm going to hammer over and over and over again. Where'd you get that? Where'd you get that? Where'd you get that? Show them. Show them. It's the second half of verse 1 where that came from. Do they see that? You're saying it like you think they can see it. They can't see it. Say it. Point them. Make their heads go down. <laughs> Don't go on until their heads go down into their iPad or whatever. <laughs> It's a new day. When I came to Bethlehem, I said, my favorite sound will be the swish of every page when I announce the text. It's gone. <laughs> no swishes anymore. A few codgers with their Bibles and the rest reading their telephones while I'm... <laughs> it's all right. God's word in a telephone. Don't hover in your preaching. A lot of pastors here. I'm pleading with you. Don't hover just above the text saying true things about the text. Point them to the text. Our authority lies in the text. The people need to make the connection. There's a lot of successful preachers who don't preach this way. I, mean, I can name lots of them. Huge churches. I just want to say they could multiply their power and their long-term deepening effectiveness for the sake of their people 20 years after they're gone if they were showing the people where they got their points and how they got their points as they preach. Bible-saturated and not just Bible-based. So here's a long quote from Spurgeon. It's very famous. I love it. You've heard it. Maybe it's very good. Oh, that you and I might get into the very heart of the word of God and get that word into ourselves. As I have seen the silkworm eat into the leaf and consume it, so ought we to do with the word of the Lord. Not crawl over its surface, but eat right into it till we have taken it into our inmost parts. It is idle merely to let the eye glance over the word, but it is blessed to eat into the very soul of the Bible until at last you come to talk in scriptural language and your very style is fashioned upon scripture models. And what is better still, your spirit is flavored with the words of the Lord. I would quote John Bunyan as an instance of what I mean. Read anything of his and you will see that it is almost like reading the Bible itself. He had studied our authorized version till his whole being was saturated with scripture. And though his writings are charmingly full of poetry, yet he cannot give us his Pilgrim's Progress, that sweetest of all poem, prose poems, without continually making us feel why the man is a living Bible. 
prick him anywhere and you will find his blood is biblene. That's the famous quote. Prick him anywhere, prick Bunyan anywhere, and you will find that his blood is biblene. Spurgeon made up a lot of words. <laughs> he did. I collect them as I read, and uh, it's great. You should make up words too. Prick him anywhere, and you will find his blood is biblene. The very essence of the Bible flows from him. So all that just to illustrate Bible saturation, not just Bible basis while you become creative up here and, and tell stories and read blogs and quote newspapers and, and try to entertain your people with what you think will interest them when they're sitting there saying, would you tell us what God said and show it in the book? I pray that RTS and the Nicole Institute of Baptist Studies will be lovingly known as Reformed Bible Saturated Theological Seminary and the Nicole Institute of Bible Saturated Baptist Studies. Spurgeon is a great example of loving the whole of biblical truth and exulting over it in the pulpit. So that's the end of point number one. One more. Two, Spurgeon loved people and labored to win them and build them. So first one, he loved truth and he exulted over it in the pulpit. And the second one now is he loved people and labored. And we'll underline that word labor to win them and build them. It appears that during his mature ministry, say the last 20 years, there was not a week that went by that souls were not saved through his preached and published sermons. This is one of the reasons, by the way, Francis, many people have embraced Charles Spurgeon as a soul winner and not embraced his theology. You can buy a 12 volume set of the Spurgeon works where Calvinism has been totally removed. Every hint of it. Because there are groups who love soul winning and they know he is the best and they can't explain how a Calvinist can be like that. <laughs> well, Calvinists sure ought to be like that. We are totally out of sync with our God, our Christ, our Bible. If we're not like that, he was always on the watch for souls. He said, one brother in our church has earned for himself the title of my hunting dog, for he is always ready to pick up the wounded birds. That was serious. His deacons were trained when he was doing to spot the people under conviction and bring them to a room. Spurgeon let us see his heart for people and their eternal good in this amazing statement. I remember when I have preached at different times in the country and sometimes here that my whole soul has agonized over men. Every nerve of my body has been strained and I could have wept my very being out of my eyes and carried my whole frame away in a flood of tears if I could but win souls. Makes me feel many regrets. So set your face, young preachers, to love people and their eternal souls. He was consumed with the glory of God and he was consumed with the salvation of people. He embodies, I think, 2 Corinthians 12, 15, I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. Can you say that, Pastor? Are you young men ready to say that? I will most gladly spend and be spent. He died at 57. And he said, I'm going to burn out here. He knew what he was doing. He said he would rather die young and do what he's doing 
than to live long and not do what he's doing. I would rather spend and be spent for your souls. Or 1 Corinthians 9, 22, I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. He knew God saves. Paul did, Spurgeon did. But we are instruments and we are essential instruments because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. He was driven never to be satisfied with past pursuits. But he pressed forward like Paul in Philippians 3. I strain, forgetting those things which lie behind, I strain forward. That's the way he lived his life. This, this quote that I'm going to read you now, just short, has been the most significant for me in getting ready for this. Satisfaction with results will be the death knell of progress. No man is good who thinks that he cannot be better. He has no holiness who thinks that he is holy enough. Wow. Let me read it again. That's real, real convicting. Satisfaction with results. I'm looking back on 33 years, all right? Right? How should I feel about them? Satisfaction with results will be the death knell of progress. No man is good who thinks that he cannot be better. He has no holiness who thinks that he is holy enough. So I was being interviewed by Colin Hansen day before yesterday online, I mean, to record, make a recording. And he said, any regrets? 33 years, any regrets? I said, everything. And here's what I meant. I mean, I had just read this. I quoted it, I think, in fact, on, on, the, on the video. I said, all I mean by that is I could have done everything better. I, could, I, I can't think of any committee I led any sermon I preached, any counseling situation, any funeral, any wedding that I couldn't have done better. The year he turned 40, it's a dangerous year, guys. 41.5, Jim Conway says you're going to have a midlife crisis and buy a motorcycle and sail boat and leave your wife. And millions do. So if you're pushing 40, Sink your roots down deep into Jesus because it's going to be some tough sledding for the next five years. It's called menopause. <laughs> Sorry. So that's only half a joke. I, I, don't know, I don't know how to explain it. I just think it's real. I think it's probably got physiological stuff going on. So he's 40 years old, and he delivered a message to his pastor's conference with a one-word title, Forward. Here's what he said. In every minister's life, there should be traces of stern labor. Brethren, do something. Do something. All caps. Do something. While committees waste their time over resolutions, do something. While societies and unions are making constitutions, let us win souls. Too often we discuss and discuss and discuss while Satan only laughs in his sleeve. Get to work. Quit yourselves like men. <coughs> That's a good idea at age 40. It's a good idea at any age. Do something. And let, me, let me relate that to regret. You not trust in Jesus if you say what I said about regretting all things, meaning you could do them better, if you let that paralyze you for tomorrow's ministry. If you draw the inference, I could have done everything better, I'm just an average, you know, C minus pastor. Well, what inference are you gonna draw from that? Work, get up, get going, do something, do something, do something. You're not called to be an A pastor, you're called to be you, right? And God will hold you accountable, not at all for being a Charles Spurgeon. No way. 
He will, he will judge you by whether you got out of bed in the morning. When you didn't feel like getting out of bed. Whether you did what you had to do until the fire fell and you loved it again. So he was 40 and he said, forward. Part of his motive for this indefatigable pursuit of souls and the glory of God was his concern about eternal punishment. He believed in hell. I hope this seminary believes in hell until Jesus comes. Here's what he said. Meditate with deep solemnity upon the fate of the lost sinner. Shun all views of future punishment which would make it appear less terrible and so take off the edge of your anxiety to save immortals from the quenchless flame. Think much also of the bliss of the sinner saved and like holy Baxter, derive rich arguments from the saint's everlasting rest. There will be no fear of your being lethargic if you are continually familiar with the eternal realities. There's just so much trifling today. Twitter is a dangerous tool. Blogs are dangerous. Humor is dangerous. Being clever is dangerous. Being an effective communicator is dangerous because it can all just hover up here in a kind of communicative fun. And people go out saying, loved it, fun, a fun time at church today. Nobody said that 50 years ago. Nobody talked that way. Now, everybody talks that way. Had a fun time in ministry, had a fun time in conference, had a fun time in church today, had a fun time. What? <laughs> what is, how, how does the word fun connect with the realities? The weight of the realities of hell and heaven and cross and death to self and joy in God. How does fun relate to that? So I'm, I'm really smacking some of you around because you, you use that adjective, which is a noun. <laughs> it became an adjective about 30 years ago. I can date it almost. That was not a good move. But... That's another talk. <laughs> when Spurgeon's love for God-centered, Bible-saturated, Christ-exalting truth fed the zeal of wanting to save perishing sinners, an avalanche of energy and ministry was created. I'm almost done. One page. But you got to feel the wonder of this man so you don't feel like you should imitate him. <laughs> an avalanche of energy, an avalanche of ministry happened when zeal for the glory of God fed zeal to rescue perishing, perishing sinners. Here's what he said. No one living knows the toil and care I have to bear. He's writing in his autobiography. I have to look after the orphanage. I have charge of a church with 4,000 members. Sometimes there are marriages and burials to be undertaken. There is the weekly sermon to be revised, the sword and trowel to be edited, and besides all that, a weekly average of 500 letters to be answered. This, however, is only half my duty. For there are innumerable churches established by friends with the affairs of which I am closely connected to say nothing of the cases of difficulty which are constantly being referred to me. On his 50th birthday, so seven years before he burns out, on his 50th birthday, a list of 66 organizations was read that he founded and conducted. Lord Shaftesbury was there and he said, this list of associations instituted by his genius and superintended by his care 
were more than enough to occupy the minds and hearts of 50 ordinary men. The missionary David Livingston asked Spurgeon one time, how do you manage to do two men's work in a single day? And Spurgeon replied, you have forgotten, there are two of us. I think he meant Colossians 1.29. It goes like this. I labor, I labor, I Spurgeon labor, striving according to his power which he mightily works within me. So there's Spurgeon and Jesus. I love that verse. I, I want that verse in the next chapter of my life. Striving, not with 67-year-old energy, but striving with his power, which he mightily works within me. Oh, that every pastor and every burgeoning, younger, dreaming pastor would hear, who trains here, learn the secret of striving in the power of another. Otherwise, you're going to burn out and be a legalist, be mean-spirited, be frustrated, angry, tired all the time, blaming other people. But if you learn this secret, and I think it is what Paul meant when he said, I have learned the secret, the secret of another's power leaned on moment by moment, hour by hour, so that it becomes an avalanche of energy for the cause of, of glorifying God and rescuing sinners. Spurgeon stands as a witness to what happens when love for God-centered, Christ-exalting, Bible-saturated truth feeds the flame of love for people, people who will perish without the gospel without God, without Christ. An explosion of zeal and energy and creativity for the church. All of it aiming to glorify God and bring sinners to himself. So, concluding, longing. May God make Reformed Theological Seminary and the Nicole Institute of Baptist Studies a breeding ground, a nursery, a seminary for such love of truth and such love for people and such energy for the ministry. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these friends who have spent their evening listening about Spurgeon. Thank you for Spurgeon. Thank you for your grace in his life, that he was two men at least. And I thank you for his legacy, and I pray that all the good things about it would be kept and imitated, and anything that's defective we would neglect and move on to greater imitation of the true one, Jesus Christ. In his name I pray, amen.